What's up, everybody? The hardest part of the ring is here to bash at the beach. That's stupid. That's a stupid way to start an episode. Whatever, it's Bash at the Beach. <laughs> WCW Bash at the Beach 1994. Got you some WCW here today on the Apron Bump. And man, oh man, what a landmark show this is. Because, uh, you know, going through, if you've been following me, following my reviews of these mid-90s shows, there is a reason for all of it, right? Because in terms of WCW, so me, if you're unaware, I never watched WCW growing up. I was an Attitude Era kid, all WWF, gave me, more, gave me all the Stone Cold and the Rocks and the S.A. Rioses, all, put, put all of that right into my veins. That's who I was, that's who I kind of still am. But, I've always wanted, I've always wanted a reason to go back and revisit WCW, and this podcast has given me a reason, and it has been quite a doozy so far. So the way I structured it is I wanted to get a few shows in before Hulk Hogan. I wanted to see kind of what WCW was before Hogan, before Nitro, before all that, right? Before WCW really took a turn, kind of at the beginning of the Eric Bischoff era. But now we've reached a pivot point. Bash at the Beach 1994 is the debut, the in-ring debut of Hulk Hogan. And do they throw him in a tag match? Do they throw him in a kind of a warm-up match? No sirree, Bob. They put him in the match of the millennium, I think is what they call it. Uh, they compared it to the moon landing. <laughs> At least Michael Buffer did on, on this show. Hulk Hogan versus Ric Flair for the WCW World Heavyweight Championship. Hulk Hogan's first match, and boy howdy do they start <laughs> with a fucking high bar here. But man, it was awesome. No complaints. Uh, so far from me, but as I said, I am still on this journey and now we get to see what WCW with Hulk Hogan looks like and this is the start of it and no better guest to join me in the beginning of that journey than my boy burying the Smarks. Past guest, past great guest, I've had him on uh, some episodes, mostly some current stuff. I think I, ha I had him on a uh, review of SummerSlam 2020. Also had him on to review AEW All Out, which, you know, just not to pull the curtain back too much, but that is definitely one of my most uh, popular episodes. You can find him on Instagram at BuryingSmarks underscore, and he also has a great podcast, which you can find on all podcast platforms uh, called Burying the Smarks. Really good podcast, really good Instagram follow as well. And I will, as always, put all of his info in the description here. So check him out. And uh, yeah, great guest, Mr. Uh, BTS over here. And I uh, wanted to bring him back for a little change of pace, a little nostalgia, a little retro. And uh, let's just you know, admire Hulk Hogan's beautiful tan and his oily, oily chest. So it's about an hour of that. <laughs> Just talking about Hulk Hogan's various vascular elements of his body and all of his striations and his all delicious boulders of shoulders that he has. Uh, albeit deflated. Now, you know, I'm, why, why am I talking about Hulk Hogan's body right now? We do that enough in the podcast. So I'm just going to get right to it. We got a lot in this show. We got Hulk Hogan. We got Ricky Steamboat. We got Stone Cold. We have Hank Aaron's there for some reason. Who knows? A lot of hullabaloo, a lot of shenanigans, but let's get to it. WCW Bash at the Beach, 1994, with myself and Burying the Smarks. So you were watching live as this was happening? Yeah, I was like in the fourth grade, man. I was like watching between that and uh, I think, what was it, that SummerSlam that same? I think, yeah, it was around the same time, yeah. Yeah. Yes, because you know, because I mean, I'd never really watched WCW. I mean, I was... I was born in 93, so I was like one years old at the time. Jesus um, Christ, man. You made me 
Honestly, I thought we were a similar age. I'm kind of surprised. You have you have a youthful voice. Oh, thanks, man. Thanks. <laughs> yeah, I was in the fourth grade, ninety four, man. So yeah, <laughs> that's, that's giving that's giving you my age right there. Man, aging you. Um, so yeah, maybe you can actually <laughs> explain some of the stuff that was on this show because, I mean, I was familiar with a lot of it. Um, mm-hmm. But that's kind of like why I, I like going back and watching these shows. It's like a whole new experience for me um, in some ways. Um, but yeah, Bash at the Beach 94 pretty much revolved around Hulk Hogan. Yeah, his um, debut. Exactly. So you were you were in the fourth grade during this show. So you probably were watching Hogan when he was in the WWF, right? Yes. For his first run. So were you like – because, you know, people that live through that time always say that like – People were getting burnt out on Hogan in WWF with him beating like Yokozuna at WrestleMania and all that. And people didn't really like it. Do you think that fatigue like carried over into WCW? Because this was only like a year after he left WWF. Honestly, I, I don't remember like me being tired of watching him. Yeah. Um, I think it was more so like the older guys that were kind of tired of watching him. But I was loving it. I was kind of disappointed when he did leave. Right, but, um, I wasn't. I wasn't tired. Yeah, I guess you were in that demographic, so yeah, it's probably geared towards you, which is, I mean, definitely a really good move by WCW, obviously, because that before, because I had watched the uh, like two, two or three pay per views before this, mm-hmm. and that was pre Hogan WCW, which is like just like pure wrestling, like Sting, Vader, uh, Tully Blanchard, like all those like older guys. Yeah. And where like WWF at this time was doing like all like the crazy characters like the Doinks and the Lex Luger and Duke the Dumpster Jose whoever the fuck and like WCW is like straight up wrestling. Yeah. So this is like the first step I feel like in WCW becoming more like a spectacle, like almost more like what WWF was. Yeah. Um, I agree. Yeah, and it's like so many dream matches. I guess the idea was to like set up dream matches that WWF never capitalized on, which is the main event of this show uh, against Ric Flair. Uh, do you think, because I was watching this, I was like, man, I'm surprised they just did Hogan and Flair right away. I would have figured they would have like eased into it a little bit. Um, I mean, do you think it was a smart move in making that like huge, gigantic match right away as, for, as Hogan's first official match? Yeah, I think they made the right call with that. Just because of the momentum they had riding with Hogan, and yeah. you know, and Flair, and it's like a, it was a dream match. I guess to them back in the day, that was what guys now want as Undertaker and Sting. Right. So they kind of took advantage of it and did it right away, and I think it was a smart move. Yeah, yeah, I, th- I think so too. Because even watching, you know, I have no context really, and I'm kind of watching it with 2020 lenses. But even mm-hmm. watching the main event, I mean, we'll get to it eventually, but it, it had a crazy atmosphere. And I really enjoyed the main event, even though I didn't really... These guys, these guys are a little bit before my time, but I, I could definitely get a sense of how how monumental it was. Yeah, it was star-studded, man. You had Mr. T, I think you had Shaq. It was a big It was a big deal in 94, you know? Fuck, why the fuck was Mr. T there, first of all? Apparently, he's friends with Hogan, you know? They're trying to I ride guess. that WrestleMania... What was it, WrestleMania 1? So... Yeah, I mean, that was, like, 10 years before this, though, which is, like, crazy. I mean, I don't know how relevant Mr. T is in 94, but I feel like it's kind of a 94? Like, nah, I don't He wasn't that big. <laughs> like, it was nah. just a guy that says, I pity the fool. Yeah, <laughs> to you this know? day, that's yeah. all he is. I mean, I, I love Mr. T, but it was weird seeing him. It was cool seeing Shaq, though. Like, I forget how sometimes how long that guy's been a huge star, like, in, in the NBA and, and elsewhere, but very young. Yeah, he had a great run that year with with uh, Orlando. So it was like, get the biggest guy in the NBA, you know, the biggest star at the time, and you bring him over. Which is do you think cool. it? Do you think it was as effective then as it is now with Cody Rhodes? Then no, that was more effective. <laughs> not now. Now it's like, why are you bring him on here? You don't want to see Cody versus Shaq? Nah, not in twenty twenty, man. The Shaq attack. The Shaq attack versus uh, was Cody's finisher. The crossroads. Yeah, there you go. No, the prince, nah. the prince of pro wrestling, I think, is his name. <laughs> oh God, <laughs> it's good, right? Man, yeah, I, I they could have got anybody else. There's a bunch of basketball players out there who are wrestling fans in this day and age. Yeah, and they could have got anybody at this point. I don't know yeah. why they went to get Shaq. Don't oh, know. 
Definitely had like a mainstream feel though, even with Shaq, Mr. T. I think they had Hank Aaron out there, which is another weird one. Yeah. Um, but it definitely like, you know, all of this kind of contributed to it feeling like a big deal. Cause like I said, the past few shows have kind of been like a little flat and a little bit like, st- I don't know if stale is the right word, but it definitely had an old school feel. And I feel like people weren't looking for that no. in 94. Mm-hmm. So Flash. Yes. They wanted Flash and, and, and Pyro and all the good stuff, you know? One Nobody represents that more than Hulk no. Hogan. Nope. There you go. Yep. So, first match here. <laughs> Speaking of flash and colors, holy shit. Johnny B. Bad versus Lord Steven Regal for the TV title. Now, uh, this was supposed to be Sting versus Regal originally, but I guess Sting had some sort of injury. So, yeah. last minute fill in here. Um, what do you so before I was like watching all these WCW shows, I only knew this guy as Mark Merrow, like as the, the boxer guy with Sable. And I'm watching that <laughs> fucking Johnny B. Bad here. He's shooting fireworks out of his hands, he's shooting glitter all over the fucking place. It, it's all over the ring and the floor, like the whole show. And <laughs> it's like borderline blackface. What he's I don't, I don't know what his whole deal is. What, what did you think of Johnny B. Bad? Oh man, um. I really didn't know much about him. I remember like that Christmas, uh, I was trying to get some Hasbro's and my mom couldn't find them. So she got me like a Johnny B. Bad toy. Mm. Oh God, them things hurt. Um, but I, I, <laughs> I, I, as soon as I saw him, like, this guy's like a rip off of Little Richie. That's Little Richard? Yeah. Yeah, so, yeah. Come to find I think out, that was the idea. Yeah. And then a few years later, I find out that he was actually inspired by Little Richie. So that's right. where he, he got his old gimmick from. But I, I thought he was okay. Um, I just thought he had too much makeup on. <laughs> yeah, it was, it was bizarre, yeah. for sure. But the glitter and, and all that stuff, I thought it was pretty cool for, like, a, a kid back then. Like, it was like, oh, shoot, look, he's got glitter and he's got mm-hmm. all the other stuff shooting out. He had a pretty good move set. You know, I think he was, like, cruiserweight, light heavyweight. For sure. So he was, was pretty cool. Super, super ahead of his time, I feel like. Because, yeah, Definitely. he was jacked. I mean, he was a pretty big dude, but he was also, like you said, had that high-flying kind of style and just stuff you didn't really see typically back then, especially in WCW. No, definitely not. So while, you know, he might have had a little bit too much eyeliner, he was definitely a, a good guy yeah. throughout there for your opening match. He had a good perm to go with it, too. It it was a perm. Yeah. It definitely yes. was a perm. <laughs> <laughs> I might use a different adjective, but... Uh, it was a good perm. <laughs> I don't know what a good perm is. I'm not too familiar. Just look at Stu, though. That's a good perm. Oh, that's a perm? Yeah, that's a perm, man. <laughs> I never would have known. I never would have known. <laughs> but uh, someone that did not have a perm was uh, Lord Stephen Regal. And, uh, man, you, you have talk about polar opposites here because you have Johnny B. Bad, who, you, you know, just talking about the flash and the colors and the sparklers and all that shit. And you have, like, the complete antithesis Opposite. of that. Yeah. And, I mean, I don't know. I, I like watching William Regal wrestle, Stephen Regal, whoever. I know he's not for everybody, but he's just so, like, he had a unique skill set, especially back then. It's kind of more prominent now, like, all that technical stuff. But back then, it was, like, really interesting to watch. And it was really cool to see, like, the dynamic between these two guys. And they put, and they meshed well, you know, they meshed pretty good. So it was it was a good match, actually. Yeah, it's, no. t- the, uh, it's always good to have your high flying versus the uh, grounded uh, technical base. So it's each one's trying to neutralize the other, so... Yeah, like you said, I thought I thought the dynamic worked really well and it meshed. Um, I've seen a few Johnny B. Bad matches before, and I haven't really been a fan of many of them, but this one was really good. Yeah, I think Regal makes anybody look good. Yeah, for sure. Uh, and the match ends with... Uh, so Regal is the uh, TV champ here. Uh, towards the end of the match, uh, Johnny B. Bad sunset flips over the ropes to try to roll up Regal. But Regal counters into a pin, which kind of looked... I think, it looked botched, yeah. It did look botched, but it almost kind of looked realistic to me. I don't know. Maybe I'm trying to <laughs> glass half full it a little bit. Yeah, but yeah. I, I feel like Regal was able to make it look pretty good. Or as, as good as it could have in that instance. So yeah, Regal gets the win here and then uh, maintains the belt. But we're not done with Regal yet. Because this next segment... I mean, it had me kind of confused, honestly. So Antonio Inoki is in the ring. Oh, yeah, yeah, I forgot about that. Dude, and I mean, it just plays into, you know, they're, they're getting all the names, all the names in sports, pop culture, and all the names in wrestling. And, you know, Tony Noki was not huge in America, but definitely 
as a global superstar, he was he was huge. Yeah. Um, they're they're giving him a plaque here, but I don't think they really say why. Did you did you catch that? No. They're literally. I think it's just. A, it's just an excuse to get him in the ring, I feel like. Yeah. They were just trying to get all the big names on one show because of Hogan's debut. Yeah. But I, I don't yeah. remember why they gave him the plaque. Could have been like a lifetime achievement. I, I'm not too sure, but yeah, I don't even know if they mentioned they it on know. commentary. Yeah. No. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it was it was worth it just for the fact that Regal came back in and basically bucked up to him. And then Noki like, takes off his jacket and they're like about to throw down. And then Regal just dips. So yeah. <laughs> it was just like a tease there. that they didn't really go anywhere. Yeah, did Anoki stick around for anything or no? Do you know? No, he didn't. No. Was he even wrestling? At that time? Yeah. Yeah, but in Japan. Right. I don't think he was wrestling in the States at the time anymore. Didn't want to do the job for Hogan, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> But uh, dude, oh, so this next match, so Vader versus Guardian Angel, and for those who don't know, Guardian Angel is the big boss man, and the backstory behind this is pretty hilarious. So they had they brought in Boss Man as the boss, and he still had he still looked the same. He still had the nightstick and the the badge and all that shit. Apparently, WWF issued a cease and desist. This is like two pay-per-views ago. It was like in the beginning of the summer. Really? So Boss Man or Ray, Ray Trailer, I think is his name, yeah. couldn't use, so he had to have a different name that wasn't in any way resembling Big Boss Man. He couldn't use handcuffs. He couldn't use a nightstick. And he just had to change his whole look. <laughs> so the, the result of that is changing him to the Guardian Angel, which is fine. I think that that's what they call like, I want to. I want to say it's like firefighters or so, something along those lines. Um, yeah, but he he just looked like a dude that you would see in Home Depot. Basically, he had this kid, the slacks and a tucked in t shirt. Uh, what do you think about Guardian Angel? Uh, well, at the time, I thought it was, well at the time I thought it was pretty cool. Because yeah. um, in New York, we had um, this vigilante group called the Guardian Angels. Mm-hmm. So they would roam the subways and the streets and try to prevent crime and all this other stuff. Like basically like a flashlight police officers, neighborhood watch kind of thing. And okay. when I saw him, I, you know, as a little kid, I'm like, oh shit, like is he part of the guardian angels in New York City? So yeah. for a while, I thought he was working with them. It was just, man, it was great to be a kid, but I, I thought it was cool. I guess it I worked it then. Cool. Cause yeah, yeah, I didn't know that's what guardian angels were. Um, I was expecting them to come out with wings or something. Yeah, they I, they wore like red berets and uh, like red jackets, and they roamed the streets like two, three in the morning, preventing crime and going into the bad neighborhoods. So yeah. I, I thought because he was a guardian angel, I thought he was like affiliated with the ones here in New York. So I'm like, oh look, that's pretty cool. Yeah, I guess so it's I didn't mind it at all. Yeah, it did. Yeah, <laughs> had me gassed up for a while. I was like, oh man, that's so cool. And, yeah. You know, now looking back at it, it, was not a cool. It was not. It was not a cool gimmick. <laughs> he didn't cool like gimmick. his white t-shirt and his no. That's, really that's how they was. dressed. Yeah, that's how they dressed. I I, yeah, yeah. I mean, it was what it was. I mean, Ray. I mean, the, the Ray Trailer, the guy. I mean, he was super underrated, in my opinion. Uh, definitely one of the bigger big man wrestlers that there ever were. And obviously Vader, who's obviously one of the best. And it's yeah. cool watching Vader because he's another guy that's a little bit before my time. And it's always cool to watch guys like that. And because, like, big man, like, the the athletic big man is kind of like a cliche nowadays. It seems like yeah, everybody's, everybody's, a, <laughs> everybody's a big yeah. man who can move. Exactly. But, like, back then, it was seriously something special. And, and Vader holds up to anybody today, in my opinion. Definitely. Yeah. And these guys had great chemistry. I think they had actually faced off for, like, a few pay-per-views in a row. Um, and it's, you know, two big guys wrestling. You kind of know what you're getting. And um, the first match with the Guardian Angel gimmick for Boss Man. So, but the match was really good. Like I said, two big guys that can move. Uh, Vader whips out like a huge spin kick. And this is Vader in his prime. And this is yeah. Vader like in his prime. So Vader was on top of his game at this time. Dude, yeah, he was. He's just an intimidating looking dude. Like, there's a lot of big guys that are just big, 
But Vader had something scary about. It. I don't know if it was his mask or if it was his his build. He had a presence about him that I don't think anybody ever had. Yeah, his whole demeanor was just intimidating, man. Yeah, that was awesome, awesome to watch. Um, so yeah, like I said, the match was good. The finish was kind of dumb though. So the ref takes a bump at some point. Uh, Vader grabs a nightstick from Harley Race, who is his manager at the time, mm-hmm. and kind of an homage to the boss, boss man gimmick and all that. But uh, the guardian angel knocks it from his hands. He picks up the nightstick, and then the ref comes to, sees guardian angel with the nightstick, and disqualifies him. Yeah. So he d- didn't even use it. It's just the fact that he was holding it. He was holding it. Like, oh, you must have came with that, so disqualified yeah <laughs> it's, it's so i don't know it just seems inconsistent with how things are done but whatever it was a fun match but yeah i mean as far as like boss man or guardian angel boss man like what was your favorite iteration of him i always loved his like swat gear in like the late 90s yeah uh, the boss man had a he had a really cool theme um but my favorite one was when he was with the corporate he was with, with vince in the, in the attitude era right the SWAT yeah, gear. yeah that was my favorite boss man yeah yeah, like yeah, say, I mean, early that's, that's 90s much boss man. With. He was pretty cool. Like his theme, his team song was pretty cool and all that. And, but How'd it go? I don't want to sing it, man. I can't sing for shit. Come on. <laughs> it's, just, it's just me and you. It's just me and you here. Oh, man. I forgot the words. But it, I mean, I, I kind of work out to it in the gym sometimes. Uh, uh, I believe <laughs> it. <laughs> you do curls to the beat of it. Uh, yeah. I, well, I do cardio oh, to it. You know? Joe, I forget the words too. Otherwise, there I would you sing go. it. See? So... I, can, I can hear it in my head. We'll just play a bed over it. When I when I put this out, and there fine. was no intro, there was nothing. It just straight straight to it. So yeah, <laughs> and I was kind yeah. of disappointed when he came back during the attitude, and he he didn't have that te- that theme. So it was still a pretty badass theme though. It's it low key yeah. one of my favorite. That's that's one I'll work out to. Uh huh. You see, we're on the same page, man. There it is. <laughs> I knew there was a link somewhere. <laughs> um, but uh, after that, we have uh, Terry Funk and Bunkhouse Buck versus Dustin Rhodes and Arn Anderson. A lot of uh, stuff we see in AEW, some little slight like tie-ins here with the Rhodes and the Andersons. Um, yeah, so yeah. That, was, that, that was kind of cool to see how, how full circle it comes sometimes. Um, the match was, uh, it was what it was, but uh, ultimately, so Dustin and Arn are on the same team. And anybody that knows anything about anything knows that that's not going to end well. Yeah, for Dustin Rhodes, because you know, obviously Arn Anderson is a horseman, and Rhodes is a Rhodes. So, yep. <laughs> is uh, I think I feel like everybody knew it, um, but ultimately, so the match is basically Funk and Buck beating the shit out of Dustin Rhodes for like 10, 12 minutes, and then Dustin finally makes the tag to Arn Anderson. Arn Anderson gets in the ring and then immediately DTs the shit out of Gold Dust, and I think uh, I guess one of one of the other guys pins him for the win. Yeah, I think it was, yeah, it was Buck who pinned them. Yeah, I saw yeah. that from a mile away, man. It was, it was like, like at the time, it was very, very predictable. Mm-hmm. And I saw that from a mile away. It was just like, when, when's it gonna happen during the match? Yeah. <laughs> that was it. Yeah, because I think Flair just turned heel recently too, and I'm, I'm pretty sure Flair and Anderson are still together at this point. So, yeah, yes, all, yes, they are. All the writings on the on the wall here, but uh. Yeah, it pretty much sets up for, I think the next pay-per-view has War Games, which is kind of funny since it just happened last night. But mm-hmm. um, yeah, pretty much setting up a stable, which I think is called the Stud Stable. It's uh, led by Colonel Parker. It's Arn Anderson, Terry Funk, Bunkhouse yeah. Buck. I think somebody was, else. Was it Vader? It might no. have been Vader. They yeah. were all, there was some party with champagne at some point in the show with all the guys in the locker room. It was a little weird, but... All the heels, right? Yeah. God, who yeah. was that? I don't remember. Um, but yeah, crazy to see. I mean, it's just a lot of the matches on this show, it's just funny to see, like, with hindsight, with 2020 hindsight, where these guys would end up. Because you have Dustin Rhodes here, who's like a pretty big factor in WCW at this point. But in one year, he'll be gold dust in WWF. It's funny because I didn't think it was that early that he debuted. Uh, what was this, 94? Yeah, 95. It's the following year. Yeah, because I, I Googled it to make sure because I could have sworn it was 96, but 
it's just, it's so crazy how fast things are changing in wrestling. I think Hogan coming in only makes it more volatile. I think. It, and then Savage coming in the next year. So yeah, it's crazy, yeah. man. Yeah. And speaking of guys that are gonna switch companies, this next they match, the landscape. They changed the landscape too. This guy coming oh, up, right? This guy, yeah. Stunning Steve Austin versus Ricky the Dragon Steamboat. And if you don't know he's the dragon, he comes out with fucking dragon wings. <laughs> and <laughs> for the WCW US title, uh, Austin is the champion. I think he's been champion for damn near two years at this point. Um, yeah, it felt like it. Yeah, I mean, I wasn't watching at the time, but I can imagine. And... Dude, I, I love. There's another instance where a guy that's before my time, but Ricky Steamboat is just so fun to watch. Yeah, he's so, he's, of his he time. moves so smooth in that ring, man. Smooth, yeah. smooth. And I think he even this is like one of his last big matches, if I'm not mistaken. I think he retired yeah. within a few months. Yeah, this was to me honestly, this was like match of the night. Oh, absolutely, and one of the longer matches. Yeah, yeah, I was looking forward to that match. It was like match of the night for me. Like it was like the main of the undercard main event. For real. I mean, it could have main evented any show, in my yep. opinion. Is this because I saw this on the card and I was like, holy shit, Steve Austin has faced Ricky Steamboat. Like it was such, you know, like I said, you know, you know and what Stone Cold would become and all that. Is it's it's awesome to see him in the ring with Ricky Steamboat, who they feel like they're different generations, but I guess they're really not. Or is a little bit over overlap here, I guess. Yeah, a little bit of overlap. But yeah, stunning Steve Austin. You can kind of see, I was watching this match, like trying to see semblances of like Stone Cold. And there, there are a few similarities, but there's definitely some significant like changes in his style back then. You know, this is pre neck injury, obviously. So that alone probably knees. changed his style a lot. Yeah, the knees. It was, it was just weird seeing him without two big ass knee braces on his legs. And he was actually, he looked a lot slimmer too. I guess when he left, he, he put on a lot of muscle because. Yeah, he was moving. He was moving quick, and he was he was really really. He was actually smaller. Yeah. Then yeah, he was very smaller. At yeah, this time. Because he went ECW is after this, right? It was between WCW and WWF. Yeah, he ninety five. Yeah, ninety five. He spent most of his year ECW, and then ninety six. Yeah, yeah, because he was injured most of the time in ECW, so he maybe took that time to. I forget what his injury was. Matter of fact. Memory serves me right. He was only ECW for like a few months because he debuted with the Million Dollar Championship like that same year, ninety five. Right, as the uh, the ringmaster. The ringmaster. So yeah, he spent like maybe six months at most. Yeah. ECW at that time wasn't. Yeah. It wasn't really long. Yeah, I think that that was a, a super common thing too back then. People hopping from WCW to ECW to WWF and all different directions. Yeah, it's the same thing that we're we're seeing now, man. It's the same thing. Yeah, you know? yeah. Um, I mean, what do you what do you think about that? Just to kind of go on a quick tangent here, with all the like co uh, not co promotion, I guess co promotion a little bit like with it, the cross promotion. Cross promotion is the word I'm looking for. Yes, just how fluid everything is with uh, certain companies and people hopping back and forth. Do you think that's uh? Do you like seeing that, or uh, what are your thoughts on yeah, that? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's pretty cool. I mean, it's nothing new, but uh, it's pretty cool mm -hmm. to see it now mm -hmm. and seeing everybody else's, like, reaction to it. Um, I just yeah. hope they actually do something with it, something worthwhile. It's mm -hmm. just not something to boost ratings. Uh, to me, back then, it's not like an old guy saying back then, but to me, mm -hmm. back then, it was more about upping the guy's image and the guy's stock before he went to the next company. Now yeah. it's just like we're just using these guys and using these this cross promotion to boost our ratings and you know and push like and push a storyline. You know, yeah. it was back then I saw it as like, all right, so it's like a, it was like a training for me to see like, oh, how this guy went to the other company, he changed his whole gimmick, changed his whole you know his whole move set. He was like, I guess uh, Steve Austin and because Steve Austin was the one who benefited the most from it. And when you think about it, he went to ECW and he just changed his whole, his promo, everything was changed about mm -hmm. him. Then sure. he went to WWF and they kind of tweaked up, they kind of tweaked his character at the time and kind of gave him the ringmaster. Right. It was kind of a gradual process because in WCW, yeah. he was like a technician. He didn't talk yes. 
a ton on the mic. He talked a little bit, but not, you know, he wasn't the mic guy. But in ECW, that's pretty much all he did, or a strong majority of what he did. Yeah. And that, that kind of, that's what that was the start of his, like, you know, don't take no bullshit, whatever attitude. And then he kind of amplified that in ECW. And then when he went to WWF, you know, like I said, they started out with the ringmaster and stuff, but eventually they took what he did in ECW and kind of molded it into whatever Stone Cold became. Exactly. And then, you know, if Austin wasn't that really good on the mic, WCW, I guess they gave him mic freedom, promo freedom in ECW, and he kind of was able to work on his promo. And then once he got to WWF, it was, it was, it was, he was going, he was going up from there. Yep. So. Yep. Yeah. And like I say, I just, crazy to see him in 94, knowing where he would be in just a matter of like two years or so. Yeah. Uh, but this, the match itself, man, like you said, match of the night easily. I mean, if we're just talking bell to bell action definitely the match of the night for me um i mean ricky steamboat just like flair can make anybody look good yeah and i, I mean not that, not that steve austin needs somebody to make him look good but you know you just combine that together and it's gonna be magic um pretty you know austin here pretty classic heel stuff you know he's faking the knee injury um he's trying to get himself disqualified by throwing steamboat over the rope because that was still a rule back then, if you get tossed over the top rope, you're disqualified mm -hmm. um, and all that stuff. But uh, eventually, after a pretty long match, it was like 20 plus minutes. Yeah. Uh, Ricky Steamboat goes for a crossbody, Stone Cold, or <laughs> Stone Cold, Steve Austin uh, counters it, rolls him up, puts his feet on the ropes, and gets the win with like a roll up. And uh, yeah, good finish. Definitely preserves uh, Steve Austin as a chicken shit kind of heel. Um, if that's what they were going for. And Steamboat busted his ass out there in one of his last, you know, marquee matches. So, awesome yeah. match to watch. If, if anybody listening, if you're going to watch one match from this show, I'd probably watch this one. Yeah. And also, it, you know, just doing a little bit of fantasy booking here. Uh, it's just, I'm trying to figure out if Austin would have stayed, would he had a, well, he, he got into a rivalry with Hogan. Because at this time, they were feeding Hogan everybody. Yeah, I was about to say, he might have had a, I don't know if it'd be a program, he definitely probably might have gotten fed to Hogan at some yeah, point. Because Hogan was chewing everybody up at this time, like, he was just running through the roster. Yeah. And then we might have had our Stone Cold Hogan dream match in 94, 95. <laughs> yeah, it wouldn't have been a dream match, but it would have been a match. Yeah. I guess. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, if, if Austin would have stayed, he, I, I don't see him reaching the heights that he ended up reaching at all. No, definitely not. But it's fun to think about. It's fun to think about. I wonder, I don't know, do you think they ever should have had, I'm trying to think like in the timeline if there's ever an opportunity. I guess like 2002 maybe they could have done Austin Hogan. Would you have, but then again, we might not have gotten Austin Rock. So. Yeah, that's knows. true. That's, that's, when, when I hear reports or I hear rumors or read stories about why these matches didn't take place, I don't know if these matches were that big for Vince at the time to give us a match. For us fans, it's like, yeah, like this is awesome. Like this is what we want. Mm -hmm. But maybe something Vince didn't see as big as we did, and that's probably why we didn't get the match. Yeah. But, but I to to play devil's advocate, I is it was between The Rock and Stone Cold and, and Hogan. I would have stayed with The Rock. Yeah, I mean, yeah, especially in hindsight, knowing how great that Rock Hogan match was, yeah. I think. You can't. It's, you can't say they made the wrong call. Yeah, and it did. A, even though the Rock didn't need it at the time, it just did a lot for him as well. Mm -hmm. So it was. It was. It was pretty cool. That was. Yeah. That was. That was a great match. But that's another day, man. That was before I get off topic here. Yeah, that was a great <laughs> match, fam. Yeah, I mean, you want to watch it now? <laughs> we'll do a show on that one day. Um, but man, what was not a great match was this next match here. The WCW Tag Team Titles, Pretty Wonderful versus Cactus Jack and Kevin Sullivan. <laughs> Pretty Wonderful, the team of uh, Paul Orndorff Paul and Paul Roma. Um, <laughs> again, like, man, I'm pretty lenient most of the time with watching these matches, especially, you know, 20 years ago, whatever this is. Um, but man, this match fucking ate shit. Yeah, like, I don't and it know. Went pretty long too. So like, it felt like the first twenty minutes where Paul Roma and Paul Orndorff 
just about to lock up and then they flex instead. I, I, I mean, the name Pretty Wonderful was pretty cool, but that was about it, about this team. <laughs> there was nothing wonderful about them. No, nothing wonderful about it. It was just, mm, no. it was just a lot of cheap, cheap, cheap heel heat with the standoffs and the posing. Mm. And it was like, God, just get it over with. There's a lot of sizzle, no substance. Yeah, and then, you know, Paul, like both Pauls are pretty good workers. And the fact that this match sucked, it was like, oh, God. Yeah, it was just, I think it's a chemistry thing. If I had to guess, because even looking at Cactus Jack and Ke Kevin Sullivan, like they each have their place, but I don't think this was it. I mean, Kevin Sullivan, from what I'm aware of, and correct me if I'm wrong, he's kind of more of a character based yeah. guy, yeah. kind of like the, the Dungeon of Doom and that kind of macabre kind of like, I don't want to say Undertaker like, but like kind of the same route, like the same genre of character. And the boogeyman. Let's say the boogeyman. Yeah, he might as well. He's a boogeyman. Yeah. <laughs> Um, but here he's just a normal guy that looks like a fucking pear. I don't know. And then you have, <laughs> <laughs> you have Cactus Jack, who at this point he's like the deathmatch guy. You know, the past few pay per views, he's had these crazy street fights with like the nasty boys and stuff like that that have been very entertaining. Mm -hmm. But here he's just in a tag match with Kevin Sullivan for some reason and don't even really understand why they have an issue with Pretty Wonderful. Um, I guess they just want the titles. I guess that's probably the extent of it. Yeah. But yeah, it, it just seemed like nobody was really playing to their strengths in this match as far as like how it was booked. Yeah, it was it was like they were just going with the motions. Like no one really had a a clear path of what they were doing or where they were going. It, yeah. It just felt very thrown together. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. It just yeah. There wasn't a lot of story to it. It felt like, yeah, like you said, just going through the motions and just drag on way too long, I think. But uh the finish, fuck, what was it? Wasn't even the finish. So the, the pretty wonderful wins the titles here. Um, oh yeah, with, they did win the titles. Hold on, so I'm like it felt more it. like a, a transitional thing then. Yeah, because I think Cactus Jack leaves for ECW pretty soon after this. Yeah, um, Kevin Sullivan sticks around for a little while longer, but I think he's mainly a Booker, like in the last half of this decade. Oh no no no, he he stood around to like ninety six. Six, because he ran ninety five with the Dungeon of Doom and right. Yeti and uh, Ming, and so yeah, he was there for a while. I think to ninety six. What a crew! Yeah, man, was uh was he in the, like an in ring competitor throughout the Dungeon of Doom stuff? Yeah, or was but he just he like a manager? A, it was a little bit of both. He he took bumps, but he wasn't like an active active guy on the roster, right? And then he had that match with Pillman. So, yeah, he was around for a while. Yeah, I don't think he became Booker until, like, 96. Like, or, okay. early, or late 95. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, like, yeah, even that, though. He's playing, you know, he's more of a character guy once that Dungeon of Doom stuff starts. So he's at least playing to his strengths. Yeah, yeah. In that. Yeah, what, what, <laughs> yeah it's kind of a divisive topic. Some people don't like it. Some people love Dungeon of Doom, but... It was what it was. Did, have you got to watch any other matches or any other segments? Not. I've seen a few segments just like out of context. Um, I didn't live through it. So you tell me, did you enjoy it? I mean, hmm. it's like that cheesy horror film that you kind of don't want to watch, but you want to watch. Yeah. That's that's what it came across like. Like, like it's so yeah, bad, it's, it's just, good. It's corny, but let me watch this. Like, let me right. see what you want. <laughs> and that was, that was the same thing every time. Yeah. It's corny, but let me watch it, you know? It's WCW 95, man, so 94, so. What a time had to be a lot of questionable things there. I mean, <laughs> the Yeti, and it was just, oh, man. Oh, oh man. I think uh, Brutus was down with them at one point. I forgot yeah. who he was. Yeah, so. Was the Yeti seems... the guy that, like, butt-fucked somebody in the ring? Was it, like, Macho Man or something? It was, oh, like, him and, the, him and the giant, like, hug like did like a double bear hug on somebody do you know what i'm talking about i've heard about that i'm trying to remember who they did it on I was, can't it, was it luger it might have been luger i don't know it was it was just, just, yeah. they're still trying to figure things out back then i think yeah no i mean it was something to do with it was corny and the cheese it was cool in a corny cheesy lovable way yeah you know it, it's, there's something for everybody and that's yeah. for somebody Maybe not me, yeah. but somebody else, somebody else. Yeah. At this point, I remember watching him on Nitro one day. I'm like, ah, I'm watching Raw. 
I'm watching. Yeah, <laughs> I'm watching Bob Holly and the One Two Three Kid instead. You mean Sparky Plug? Sparky Plug. Absolutely. You know, I'm watching the Smoking Guns. <laughs> so I'm not watching the Dungeon of Doom. Yeah, I remember that much. Man, when you prefer the Smoking Guns, that's yeah. yeah that tells you something. Yeah, yeah. No, I was like, uh-uh, I'm changing the channel. <laughs> so, but uh, that brings us to the main event. The thing that everybody came to see, the dream match of the century. I think Michael Buffer compared this to the moon landing. Uh, yeah. Pretty much the same, I think. Yeah, the moon landing. <laughs> it was fake. <laughs> <laughs> moon landing was fake, so yeah, I'll compare it to that. <laughs> that sounds like a completely different podcast we need to do in the future. but Yeah, man. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so, uh, so Hogan... Like we said, they set this up with like all the uh, celebrities in the crowd and all like like Anoki and all that, um, just making it feel like a big fight feel. And you know, I'm watching this show and it does feel like uh, like a different atmosphere than uh, Slamboree was the month before or Spring Stampede. It felt like a big deal, um, and it's Hogan and Flair, so how could it not? So. Shaq comes out holding the uh, the world title for some reason. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's my favorite part because he looks so serious. Like they gave him one job to do, and he's like, "I'm gonna get the job done." <laughs> he just marched out there with that title. Like it was, yo, you're not taking it from me. Don't dribble the man. title. Don't dribble the title. Yeah, right. <laughs> oh man, man, Shaq just always looks like he's confused, even to this day. Yeah, he was like, um, go out with the title. You get it to the ring and you don't drop it. He's like, got yeah. it. And that was it. That's all you had to <laughs> <Don't>, tell him. <laughs> don't trip over the ropes. Don't hurt Hogan. That's all you got to do. Say hi to Mr. T. What a cast of characters is out there. Jimmy Hart's out there. Oh, man. God. <laughs> you wanted colors. You got faces. colors here. Yeah. <laughs> Shit, load of colors in there, man. I have a oh, question man. for you. What's up? Are you big trouble? Uh, oh, my God. What the fuck is it called? Trouble? Not trouble in paradise. I hope the Thunder show happened. Thunder, Thunder in Paradise. Paradise. <laughs> yeah. Were you a big Thunder in Paradise fan? Uh um, I caught it a few times, but oh man, rest his soul. My grandfather liked that show. I don't know why. Yeah. I don't know why. He was like, hey man, this guy's on TV. You want to watch it? I, yeah, I kind of lean over. I'm like, no, man, I'm good. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I haven't caught it yet, but maybe one day I'll uh I mean I'll if it's oh man, how can I explain it? It's it's like a typical action. TV show like it's just the stories made no sense and mm. I don't think it was supposed to but it was man listen I don't even know why he watched it and it was just weird <laughs> was just for weird. Hogan I think that the people making that show are like hey let's get Hogan on a show and then we'll figure out the plot afterwards we'll figure out the plot we'll just get all the old folks to watch it man exactly. I don't know man I wish I could have asked him but he was just like hey man your, your guy's on TV. I'm like, my guy. I'll look. I'm like, man, that's not my guy. And I'll just walk away. Yeah. Man. Deflated Hogan. Don't even recognize He's, him. Yeah, with, with a black, with like a brown mustache or brown beard. Oh, man. oh he dyed his hair for it? Man, yeah. I literally have, I, don't, I know nothing about this show. Like, I've never even seen any pictures of it or anything. Yeah, you got to catch it, man. Like, I think you'll get a kick out of it. you get a man. kick out of it. Oh, I trust your recommendations. So. Yeah, man. This, have you, you, ever seen the, you ever seen The Nanny with Hogan? No, I haven't seen the nanny. Oh, come have on! Have you man, seen the nanny? Of course, of course. Oh, uh, you're you're big Titanic, Mark. So I shouldn't be. Surprised. That's right. Yo, '90s <laughs> movies, man. Uh, the nanny. Uh, come on! I know you watched *Women Commando*. No. Oh, but, the one with dude, the you're like taker? twenty years. You're like twenty years older than me. We're we're completely <laughs> different. <laughs> the, the, I mean, it's the one with the Undertaker. He plays like a, a space bounty bounty hunter. What is it called? Suburban Commando. What year is that that come out? Man, listen, I was like in kindergarten when I came out, I, but I so, didn't see it till years later. Was it before Undertaker was a character? No, Undertaker. Whoa, that's a good question. This this had to come out like in ninety one or ninety. Okay, so it's early enough to where people might not associate him with that, maybe, but it's yeah, still. Well, yeah, he's. I mean, and the guy. That Christopher Lloyd is in the movie too. Whatever it is, just watch it. You get a kick out of it. You get a kick <laughs> out always, of it. Trust me. I always love watching wrestler movies. Like I watched the um, the Condemned the other day, 
And now I'm getting all these recommendations for these random ass Stone Cold movies, which apparently he's done like a shit ton of movies, by the way. I don't know if you know this. Yeah, yeah. He's done he's done like 20 fucking action movies and they're all the same thing. Um <laughs> I don't know how we got here, but we're talking about yeah, Hogan no. versus Flair, goddammit. <laughs> I'm trying to think, like, what were you talking about before this? We're yeah, talking about right, the moon keep... landing. We're talking about Hogan and how it's the same thing. Shaq's there. It's all it's all silly. It's all um, it's all it's all good. <laughs> so yeah, like yeah, like we were talking about. So tr- trouble, not tr- tr- tropical paradise, right? No, Thunder in Paradise. paradise. <laughs> Thunder paradise. <laughs> That's the uh, the paradise. Ben Stiller movie, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, it's all confusing. But Thunder in Paradise, there we go. What's even more confusing is how different Hogan looks here. Man, I mean, this hey, is like... Right off the Stenworth scandal. Yes, you, you read my mind. Yeah. I guess uh, it's, it's crazy how that'll just change your face completely. Yeah, and your body, everything, man. I mean, he looked good, though. He looked he looked like a regular guy. He lo- I With, mean, I guess. Yeah. He looked more like an athlete, I think. Yes, yes. He looked like he was training for the Olympics. Yeah. That's what he looked like, yeah. He looked like the Hulk Hogan with the 24-inch pythons. Yeah. So. Who's, who's tan did you like better, Hogan's or Flair's? Oh, Hogan's. Hogan's looked natural. <laughs> you didn't think Flair's looked good? Flair's looked like it was, it was like a spray tan. With his bleach blonde hair or platinum yeah. white, whatever it was. That Hogan, Man. Hogan, off topic, I have met Hogan and his mm-hmm. tan looks really good in person like i know sometimes on tv you can see it and you're like what the fuck yeah. but in person i don't know maybe it's because i met him in the summer but his tan was on point just to big point that out on point. really that's yeah. shocking i mean it was a fake tan because he had no tan lines right no tan lines at all like the guy was in a tank top he had no tan lines <laughs> so i'm like this is I mean, a fake tan but it looked good point, at what point does a uh, fake tan just become a real tan you know what I mean? I don't know. We got we got to ask Snooky for that. Yeah, <laughs> Snooky reference, man. Yeah, this, this podcast is everything. Yeah, it um, is. Bad. <laughs> <laughs> but yep. So this, this the whole match gets set up with everything. It has a lot of pop and circumstance. Um, then the match starts, and I mean, it was look, man. I mean, both these guys are kind of honestly towards the end of their careers, as, at least as like full time guys. I guess Hogan really isn't. I mean, he's got a few years left. Yeah, he's got like 15 years still left after that. I mean, yeah, I guess. Yeah. But uh, it depends on what you consider, you know. I don't know. But the match itself was, uh, I enjoyed it. I mean, it's kind of a typical Hogan style match. Um, yeah, yeah. Back and but forth. With a, yeah, but with a, uh, <laughs> an added flair to it. Um, <laughs> God, you're on one today, huh? You're on one today. Such good shit, such good yeah, shit, brother. Good, such good shit, pal. Yeah, <laughs> but uh, yeah, I, mean, I enjoyed the match. I mean, the crowd energy was like on a completely different level. I mean, it's Hogan's first WCW match, his first match, period, in like at least a year, I think. Um, yeah. And I mean, Flair, like like we said, he can make anybody look good, and I think they just meshed pretty well. Um, definitely, yeah, it was a dream match. It was a match that everybody's been wanting to see. Um, do you think it lived up to the hype? Yeah, I mean, it did. I don't, yeah. I don't, whether which, whatever promotion they would have fought in, whether it would have been WWF, it would have been the same, same result. It would have been the same match between the two. So, I, yeah, I, it, it kind of lived up to the hype. Yeah, I think so. I mean, I was watching this, man. And I was getting the goosebumps watching like the end of it. He does the big boot and the leg drop, like typical Hogan shit. But man, it works every time. Every time. Every time. Seventy five percent of the time. Every time. But uh, <laughs> so yeah, good match here. Uh, Hogan obviously gets the win because he's Hulk Hogan. Yeah. Uh, wins the big gold belt and uh, he buries Ric Flair. Yeah, Buried Fla- <laughs> never recovered. <laughs> never. That was it. That was the end of him. They misused him. No, no, nobody even remembers him. Mm-mm. Mm-mm. But uh, yeah, man, so awesome finish, awesome main event, and that brings the show to a close. I mean, there were there are a lot of high points in the show, a few low points, but overall, I mean, I enjoyed watching it. What about you? Yeah, I really did, man. I brought back memories, seeing Flair Hogan, seeing uh, Cactus Jack, seeing Vader and my good friend the Guardian Angel. So oh, yeah. <laughs> brought back memories, good memories. 
Yeah, for sure. And yeah, like I said, just cool to see guys before they became stars and all the shit. It was definitely a fun watch. If anybody, yeah, uh, it was uh, it. one of those pay per views where you had the younger guys in the in the vets, and they all meshed well, except mm-hmm. for like pretty wonderful one, Cactus Jack. But for we the most part, it. you had Austin and Steamboat. They meshed well. Then you had Regal and Johnny Bad. They meshed mm-hmm. really meshed well. So the car was very balanced as far as talent. Yeah. So it, it worked out for everybody. Everybody looked good in doing so. For sure. Especially considering they could have just rested on Hogan versus Flair. But I feel like they put together a, a top to bottom, top to bottom, pretty good, pretty good car. Yeah. Something for everybody, I think. And the fact that they had like, uh, I think they had Jesse Ventura on commentary, right? Yeah, that was a, that was a weird thing too. They they were like switching color commentators because they started with Heenan, yeah, and they brought in Jesse Ventura, and I think they went back to Heenan. I don't know if that was by de- I mean, I'm, I'm sure it was by design, but I guess it was maybe to keep a fresh voice in the booth. And Tony Schiavone stayed. He didn't swap out. He stayed throughout the whole pay per view, right? Nah, Tony's a workhorse, man. Yeah, he, he wanted that all. paycheck. He gave said, "Give me the overtime." <laughs> yeah i mean it's funny seeing jesse ventura there considering i mean it's pretty well known i think that ventura and hogan hate each other yeah so was was he there in the main event jesse ventura i don't even remember no i think it was uh heenan because he was throwing out a lot of uh, heel references yeah so i think it was uh heenan and shivani i could be wrong yeah I'm pretty sure someone's gonna like say this guy don't know shit once they listen to this podcast. So yeah. <laughs> I'm just saying right now, I might be wrong in this, but I think if you're I right. am, I'm with you. I'll go down with the, with you. Like the don't Titanic kill me. Did. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> don't kill me. Yeah, but uh, yeah, good show, man. Any other thoughts on this? No, Cash I just beach. like you said, it was a pretty cool show to see everyone before they made it to the next stage in their career. You had Dustin Rose, you had Austin, you had Mick Foley, you know, you had Johnny B. Bad. It was it was pretty cool, man. Yeah, kind of a transition time. Yeah, I feel like. Um, I mean, we're still a few years from uh, NWO, and still at least a year from Nitro. I think, I think about a year from Nitro. Yeah, and I showed ninety five September first. Well, yep. September ninety five. I'm wrong with dates. I'm gonna say September of ninety five. <laughs> you sounded confident. Uh, I'm gonna make you stick with it. Yeah, I could be wrong. I'm just playing that out there. But September, I'm definitely right on. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'll give you that one. Um, but yeah, man, I think that's all I got. Uh, you watching Impact tomorrow? Impact, yes. I was told. I was told so. I was told so to do so. I will be watching yeah. it tomorrow. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah, I mean, I'm I, gonna I was watching t- it for the first time in ten years. I think. Yeah, I was told there may be some surprises on Impact tomorrow. So tune in. I said great. From your sources, unnamed sources? Unnamed sources, yes. I can't because uh, I don't want to name any sources, but it was like, hey, man, do you watch Impact? I said, no, I don't. <laughs> I was like, watch <laughs> it. Watch it tomorrow. I'm like, why? I was like, oh, you may be surprised. So I'm like, all right, cool. Do you actually not know? If, what do you mean? Of what's happening tomorrow? Yeah, yeah. Or who's scheduled uh, to appear? Um, I, I don't know. You. I'll, I'll let I, you I, find out. Oh, so you know already. I mean, I know one guy is going to be there. Kenny? Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. Everybody knows that. Okay. He has to be on there. I was like, man, this guy doesn't know. This guy thinks wrestling still work. <laughs> <laughs> this guy didn't know shit about wrestling. They're going to be on. They should. You know what they should do? They should have Impact on Wednesday and have Kenny Omega be on both shows at the same time. Oh, <laughs> that's what we need. More yeah. Wednesday wrestling. <laughs> we need more Wednesday wrestling. More ratings yes. war. Exactly. And more demos. <laughs> more demos. We'll see what we'll see what the demos have for impact. Uh, I'm sure the demos were great for Bash at the Beach '94. Of course, uh, the eighteen, the eighteen to forty nine. They had like five percent. They had five points on there. They did great. Wow. I think they were watching Sparky Plug, man. Yeah, and the buy rate was off the hook that year. Oh, it had one hundred and fifty thousand for uh, for the revenue. Oh, is that what it was? The, no, I'm just pulling out oh. numbers, man. <laughs> I was like, this guy got some notes. <laughs> no. Uh, I mean, 1994, I would say 150000 buy rate would be really good. 150000 Yeah. This is 94. I mean, I mean, were you ordering... Well, see, you wouldn't know, man. You was ordering pay-per-views. 
No, I was still trying not to shit my pants in 94. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. What was that? No, I I'm, I'm going to look it up. Views. I'm going to look it up right now because you got me curious. Yeah. Um, that seems like a low number to me. See, my mom had me kind of on a strict, strict, strict pay-per-view choice. And she was like, either watch. WrestleMania was a no-no because WrestleMania costs more. It's like 50 bucks. Mm. So she was like, okay, so you either want to watch WrestleMania, the one pay-per-view for the whole year, or you want to watch SummerSlam. So yeah. I had to pick and choose. But I had a cool neighbor down the hall from us who had an illegal cable box, and he would have me come over and watch it for free. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, true story, man. Your, your, your secret's safe with me. Yeah, true story. This guy was really, really cool. Like, he was a lot older than me, but uh, he was like, hey, man, I'm watching pay-per-view. You know, I got the hot box. I said, all right, come over. You know, that's, that's funny you say that because when I was growing up, we got pay-per-views for free. I th- always thought it was some sort of like, like I don't know, error, some twisted wire somewhere. But mm-hmm. My parents must have been up to some sketchy shit, I guess. Because I watched, my first show I ever watched was WrestleMania. <laughs> it just happened to pop on the TV. And this is before you can just like hit a button on the remote and buy it, you know? So oh, yeah. it's not like I hit something. Who knows? So your but, parents knew somebody way up there in the cable chain. They got they got you guys hooked up. I guess, man. I was watching like Small Soldiers and shit, all the movies. Man, I'm, I'm learning man. right now. I don't know how to read buy rates. What does 1.02 mean? I don't know. Because that was the buy rate. 1 million? <laughs> I'm going to say 1 million. We're gonna say one million for that year. That's a lot, man. It's Hogan and Flair, you know. Yeah, but this is is this is not their main pay per view, right? Oh, it's fucking Hogan and Flair. I mean, Fall Brawl the the next month does like half of that because I don't think Hogan is even on that. Is he? He what? I'm confused, man. I could have sworn he was on there. I remember seeing like a poster. He was he had like the uh, the war paint on him. You sure that wasn't ninety five? See, man, don't trust me because I'd be wrong. Man, you Let's got me see. doing all this, all this research right here. Let's see, we got no Johnny Hogan Madigan. was not on here. No, nope, but we get Vader versus Guardian Angel again. Thank God. And then the attendance was sixty five hundred compared to fourteen thousand. Yeah. Yeah. So. Well, we'll do a business podcast next time. Yeah, I'm the wrong person to give out business advice. We'll have all our figures <laughs> I'll try together. my best. I'll yeah. try my best. <laughs> Fake it till you make it. All right, man. Well, yeah. Thanks again. Thanks once again, man, for joining me on this. It's always of course, a pleasure. Man. And I, I apologize. It's just I got to get my life together, man. So nah. the next time I got you, man, I'll, I'll be right on point. You know, I, I should be going on vacation uh, for the remainder of December. So if you have anything lined up for me, just let me know. And also, I would like to get you on mine. My podcast. yeah, for sure. Yeah, I saw you started it up again. I listened to a yeah. little bit of it. Yes, my wife is like she's like my co-host now, so she's really I've good heard, at interviewing yeah. and asking questions. So does she, does she like, interview you? That's what we're gonna do on later tonight. So, man, put fun. yourself over on your own podcast. <laughs> yeah, exactly, like it, my guy. <laughs> exactly. So she's like, I got the good questions to ask you. I'm like, all right, whatever, man. Just yeah. freestyle it. <laughs> well, I'll definitely Just, be catching that. Yeah, man. Once again, thank you to Burying the Smarks for joining me on this hilariously fun episode. Good old BTS is always a good. I'm not gonna. <laughs> I'm not gonna call him BTS. That was just a thing I did. Isn't that like a fucking boy band or something? Like an Asian boy band? Man, that is that is the opposite of what Burying the Smarks is. <laughs> But yeah, a lot of fun here in a really big show in the history of WCW. Like I said, my past 1994 WCW episodes have kind of been the pre-Hogan era, getting a kind of a sense of what it was like before Hogan. And honestly, it was pretty, uh, pretty whelming, if that's a word. Uh, but man, WCW at this point is, uh, they're not going to be perfect. But man, the fire is definitely lit, and we're still about a year out from Nitro, but man, they got some momentum going now. And uh, make sure to subscribe and uh, to continue listening to these episodes, as well as other different uh, series of wrestling. Uh, next week, we got some progress wrestling coming at you. Got my 50th episode Q&A, which by the way, you can still submit questions. Uh, just go to my Twitter and my pinned tweet has a uh, tweet where you can respond to, where you can DM me here, 
uh, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, MySpace, Grinder, wherever I'm, wherever I am, you can find me. Uh, send me a DM for a question. I'll give you a shout out on that 50th episode. Um, but yeah, man, that's about all Daddy has for you today. Thank you guys once again for listening. I'm hard.